Shinjin Rui is a super difficult shoot 'em up with a weird theme that never quite manages to be as good as it should be, partially because of how difficult it is. I'm saying all of that up front because this is a game where the story behind it is way more interesting than the game itself. Let's start with the publisher, Rick's Soft. This is the only game to come from Rick's Soft, so who are they? Well, they're the short-lived game publishing division of the company Rico Elemex, who these days are best known for making watches. They're pretty diversified, though, and in the mid-80s, they were also making semiconductors. In particular, they were one of the companies making chips for the Famicom. So it's understandable why they might want to try their hand at video games. Except, they're not really doing that. The thing is, Shinjin Rui was made by Hudson Soft. But Hudson Soft is already a publisher on the Famicom. So what's happening there? And that gets us into behind the scenes politics at Nintendo. And in particular, how Nintendo was forcing changes to the licensing agreements with their third parties. The original licenses to publish games on the Famicom were pretty good deals. Anybody who got on board early could manufacture their own carts. And for arcade manufacturers who already had deals with chip suppliers, that meant they could augment the Famicom's library pretty quickly. Well, now we're in 1987. The Famicom is a giant hit. And Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi has decided he wants more money. Even if it means walking all over the partners who helped build their platform. To do this, he decides to implement the same restrictions on Famicom publishing that they placed on publishing for the NES in the US. All cartridges have to be manufactured by Nintendo, and only five games a year. Keep in mind, this isn't about preventing a software glut. The software glut's already happened, and the Famicom is still going strong. This is solely about extracting more money from the people making games on the Famicom. That sets off a revolt among the publishers. The new ones and the small ones, they have to take what Nintendo's dishing out. But companies like Namco? They already have their own production line. They can just ignore the requirements and keep making games. Hudson Soft, however? They were reliant on Nintendo's cartridge manufacturing. And so they attempted a two-pronged approach. One? setting up a dummy company to publish their games, which brings us back to Rick's Soft, and the alternative, make their own console. We'll talk about that one when we get about six months down the line in the chronology. And we're still not to the game yet with Shinjin Rui, because it's a licensed game. The main character in this game is Riki Choshu, a popular professional wrestler. In promotional material featuring him, he declares that the game is no jobber. His name is retained in the US version of Shinjin Rui, which was changed to Adventures of Dino Riki. The game itself has absolutely nothing to do with wrestling, which has made people suspect that it was a game that Hudson was developing and then just stuck Riki in. One of the only things that the game is remembered for is the strange message in the manual, supposedly written by Riki Chosu himself. If you want to hear that, wait till the end. The title Shinjin Rui can be translated as The New People, though the game spells it out as The New Type. Supposedly, this title came about because all of the programmers were new to the Famicom. Okay, I think four minutes in is a good point to start talking about the game. It's a shoot-em-up where the action has been moved to the ground instead of space. As Riki slowly advances up the screen, monsters appear and he shoots them down. Eventually, he'll reach a cave with a boss in it. There are four stages in total in Shinji and Rui, and then the game loops after that. If you want to have any chance of making progress, you'll need to collect some power-ups. They're hidden inside different objects on each stage, so you shoot the flowers on the first stage, the pots on the second, and the skulls on the third. 
inside those, you'll find icons. And annoyingly, you can't shoot over the icons. So power-ups get in your way just as much as obstacles do. The diamonds are just some points. You'll still want to collect them since the threshold for extra lives is super low in this game. You earn an extra life every 10,000 points. The fist powers up your weapon. You go from small fireballs, to axes, to boomerangs, to a flamethrower. The rate of fire in Shinji and Rui is pretty slow. I didn't have to break out a rapid fire controller to overwhelm it. The feet are speed increases. And I found that you only really want one. Get more than that and you'll really start flying everywhere. This actually causes a bit of a problem because when you get hit, it steps your power-ups down one level. Dropping from boomerangs to axes isn't a big deal. But when the speed levels are too slow, just right, too fast, and ah, I can't stop, dropping a level is actually a problem. In some of the tougher pots, you'll find meat and hearts. Hearts increase your maximum life bar by one, and meat restores your life bar. You can also find power-ups in spots where there's nothing. Shoot the right place and you might find a star, and that destroys all enemies on the screen. The strangest feature in Shinji and Rui is how you jump. There are some sections of the game where you have to jump to get over some barriers. Falling in is an instant death, too. You don't stop marching up the screen, so the platforms you're jumping between move underneath you, and even once you land, you keep going up. Getting across the water can sometimes require precision movement. And precision movement is something that you don't have in this game. Annoyingly, this is the only thing that jumping is good for. You can't dodge enemies or bullets with it. You still get hit by them. The result is jumping is annoying instead of being a fun addition. When you do get a game over, it is possible to continue. You have to hold down up and then press start when you're on the game over screen. Then you'll pick up right where you left off, though being without power-ups in some spots can make it almost impossible to continue. And that's Shinjin Rui, a strange one-off experiment that's more interesting for what's happening around it than the game itself. The game itself is okay. It feels like second-tier Hudson, so you can understand why they passed it off to someone else. Maybe with a little bit more refinement it could have worked, but there's just too many little problems. Like the way that the enemies spawn in. You get these enormous waves of them that drop in on you. Sometimes they fire off a huge barrage of attacks that have no opening. If you're standing in the wrong spot and your shots are getting blocked by a pickup, you'll quickly get run into a corner. And the way that the movement works is just awful. I feel like if jumping was a dodge, that might fix most of the game's problems. As it stands, this is an almost completely forgotten game that mainly acts as a signpost for the changes in the Japanese gaming industry at the time. Hi everybody! Are you playing well every day? Are you studying hard? You can't just be a hero by playing and studying. Let me tell you a little bit about how Riki can make the game better for you. First, the Famicom game is also physically fit. Kitties can't just play games. Go outside and play some soccer to get stronger. It will make you light on your feet in the game, too. Second, the Famicom game is focused. Playing sloppily for hours just doesn't work. If you play for one hour a day, concentrate on it for one hour. Nobody without concentration can beat Ricky. You can do it. Finally, the Famicom game is also smart. Use your head and come up with different strategies and options. Don't rely on other people. Think for yourself. Doing this? 
even the first time you play, you'll be able to get a high score. Take my advice and become a hero.